Recording in progress. I really enjoyed chapter three, and I'm really happy to be able to chat with you about my thoughts. Um, to me, it has a couple of themes that are running through it. Um, the first being that um, right up front, Thich Nhat Hanh says, to meditate does not need, mean to sit still and think. And I can't tell you how many hours I've sat on the cushion with my mind very busy thinking of things. <laughs> so this is such a good reminder. It's like, no, no, it's not about thinking mind. And um, the reason is that when we think, we're immediately being taken away from the present moment. That's why we anchor our practice in our in-breath and our out-breath, or we anchor our steps in the sensation of our feet on the earth, because we're working to develop a sustained concentration on the present moment. And what happens in the second theme for this chapter is that we get ideas, we get thoughts that um, are actually obstructing our freedom and our happiness and they cause us to suffer. And I find this to be a really profound insight that a lot of our suffering is caused by our own thoughts. And so our practice is in letting go, in in turning towards the sensations and the experience of the direct present moment because life is found only in the present moment, as we know. So these thoughts that we can, can get snagged by, get caught by, he calls them illusory perceptions. Illusory perceptions. And he even goes so far in this chapter to encourage us to um, find the answers that we seek in life without thinking. And this is so radical. This is so different from what we hear in the rest of society. Um, our education tells us to really think carefully and, and we, we train ourselves in you know, being rational and following certain cause and effect, you know, it's very, very uh, engaged with using our head. We get rewarded for that. But he's saying that the invitation is to rest our mind consciousness, to just rest our mind and to entrust our store consciousness, our subconsciousness with finding the answers that we seek. And he said, don't let your thinking interfere with the process of accessing your wisdom. So you're aware that um, we talk often about the mind consciousness and the subconsciousness. And you know, we usually draw a circle and we put a line somewhere through the middle. And the top half we refer to as our thinking mind. You know, our, those are, that's the, the narration that goes on in your head all the time. And the bottom half is your subconscious or your store consciousness. And he said that, you know, when we, when we breathe, when we walk in meditation, what we're doing is actually settling into the wisdom that is much more vast, much older and more resourced than our perceptions feeding our thoughts in our mind. And that's why we feel so incredibly um, nourished, but through our walking, through our sitting, through spending time in nature, because we're accessing that storm consciousness. And he said, he calls this part our true mind, our true mind. And that that's where silence is, that there's a, an awareness beyond words, that um, it's more vast than all of our mental constructs and ideas. 
And he even goes so far to say, this is where the heart resides. So you've heard the phrase, you know, use your head or think with your heart. And we know those are two very different things. We've experienced the difference between those. But so oftentimes society criticizes when we lead with our heart, when we, we act from the response in our heart. Because society is rewarding our heads, not necessarily our hearts. And sometimes we even blame our hearts for being rash and um, um, you know, spontaneous, not thinking things through. You can hear all the, the language around this. But what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying is that when we settle into our heart's consciousness, our true mind, there's nothing rash about that. That that's a whole different process. And that that's where so much of our insight actually originates from. And that this process of silence and coming into a relationship with our heart and the wisdom of our heart is really possible no matter the outside conditions, no matter what's going on in our circumstance. So that's, that's what this particular chapter is inviting us to work with. Now, I know for myself, that I have found relationships in my life to be full of notions and ideas. That I have all kinds of thoughts about, you know, this person is like that, this should be like that, why is this like that? Because I think it should be, you know. And I can watch in real time, if I breathe, I can watch those expectations, those notions, those thoughts I have about what's happening in a relationship. And I can say, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. And I can continue to stay present with what's happening in the relationship. And there's two relationships in particular that came to mind as I was preparing this talk that are especially challenging for me. And I can say that in the work that I've done in this particular area about staying present, about letting go of my notions about what should and shouldn't be, that I can see that my ideas are the very things that make me suffer in these relationships. And Anne was so helpful in our talk last week, you might recall Anne Gill said, you know, sometimes when she's in relationship and there's something that's really hard. She's been trained to just say word, 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 and it helps to keep her present and a little bit buffered from what she feels coming at her. I think what Thich Nhat Hanh is encouraging us to do is to, it's very similar to that, is to focus on our breathing. And it's almost like the infinity sign, you know, that we can breathe in, and exhale, and inhale, and exhale. And we can do that as we're listening, as we're engaged, and to take part of that awareness. And so our listening becomes a meditation in and of itself. We're both listening deeply, and we have our awareness on our breathing. And what that does is, as we're doing that, you know, we might also notice body sensations coming up discomfort, but we're able through our breathing and through staying present and engaged in the listening, we're able to find our silence in that moment and not have our insides be completely upended and disturbed. Or when they start to get a little, oh, we can notice it and take care of it in the moment. I certainly didn't always do this. I, as a younger woman, I was involved, as you all know, in advocacy and, you know, I was doing mom's apple pie work, but I would meet people in city government, county government, businesses that thought, you know, this was not helpful and they would have quite a different take on what I was saying. And I used to get so 
uptight and so disturbed inside that I developed this thing that I had to do because I needed to stay present. So I would sit there with my notebook and I would write down cuss words. And I would write down declarative statements about the situation and what I really thought. But I would do it all pretty close and nobody ever saw what I was writing. But I suspect that even though I was silence, silent, I was communicating an attitude loud and clear. I'm sure my foot was crossed and just, you know, flapping away, and you know that the, my attitude was shining through. And that's not the kind of silence that's very helpful, you know. So this is a wholly different thing. Mm, I like that. Holy, W H N H O. Um, this is a wholly different thing. And the practice is learning how to find that, that deeper silence and stability in the midst of what's going on. And in my experience of that personally, it feels very much like staying grounded with one foot in the historical dimension, you know, what's happening right here, right now, and the other foot in the ultimate dimension of what's happening right here and right now that ultimately we are on the earth, moving through space, human beings at this coordinate of space-time doing the best that we can. And when I can start to understand the larger context of the moment, then I can begin to bring understanding and compassion to myself and to other people because you know, maybe what we're doing is fundamentally hard. And, you know, I can take care of both myself and the other person a little bit better. So having that awareness of what's happening in my body and in the moment, coupled with the awareness of the ultimate reality, that helps me to stay steady and undisturbed. And we use mindfulness, the things that we're practicing in our walking and in our sitting, we use that to become aware of every feeling we have and every perception, every thought that's coming into our, our head. And um, we use it to stay fully present with ourselves and um, access, as I said, the ultimate in real time. So. Silence, in this instance, what Thich Nhat Hanh is talking about, is what we can access from our heart, from our true mind, um, from our store consciousness. And it doesn't simply mean the absence of talking. This is something much more profound, much more nourishing than just some restriction to stop talking. This kind of silence contains peace. It contains joy. It contains um, relaxation. And it has the power to heal. This kind of steadiness. Um, he calls it dynamic and constructive. This kind of silence. And he also likens it to the, the Buddhist terminology of thundering silence. Thundering silence because it is full of energy and it is informed by the insight of our store consciousness. So it's not passive. It is thundering silence. I'd like to give you some examples of some of the things that came up. I'm like, okay, huh, how, do I, how does this work? And, you know, Ty poses this question. He says, um, what notion is making you suffer? What idea do you have that's making you suffer? And I was not really coming up with anything immediately, but I flipped the question and I said, how am I suffering? And what is the idea that's feeding that suffering? I thought that was much more accessible for me. So I was able to go, okay, well, you know, I suffer in big and small ways. Um, 
some examples. As you all know, um, my father is in memory care and he's now living in Las Vegas. Um, he's moved there. And I have um, moments of missing him terribly because I can't pick up the phone and call him. Um, and I have an idea that we're separated because of the distance. Well, that idea I can sit with and just ask the question, am I sure? And do I know that to be a true statement? And in reality, my father is in every cell of my body. I am not separated from him at all. And with that insight, with that sort of deep knowing the truth of that, when I lay there at night and I had been feeling bad and upset and all that, it's like, no, I have the power to care for him by taking care of my own body and bringing peace and well-being to myself in this moment. It is a direct gift to my father in me. So I want you just for a minute to hear the pattern of this. So there's the suffering. I miss my dad. There's the thought. We're separated. There's the deep looking and realizing the fallacy of that, the, the incompleteness of that idea, if you will. Immediately, I can let go of it. And then I have this possibility of taking a loving action. So that's, that's the pattern. Next example. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm missing out. <laughs> and I um, particularly have this, this thought that family should be close. You know, and let's, let's take this example, like, specifically for grandchildren. Oh, I'm missing out on so much of their growing up years. Family should be close. Oh, oh, oh. Right? The more I cling to that idea, the more I suffer. When I stopped and looked at that idea, I realized that um, I have an insatiable craving for my grandchildren. There's no way I can get enough of them. And I also experience being with them sometimes, and it feels like way too much. They exhaust me. And I still don't have enough of my grandchildren, right? It's like, I am just insatiable when it comes to that. So I realized, oh, no, I actually have enough. Because what I can do is I can pick up the phone. I can write them a little letter. I can send cookies. I can, I can do a, a loving act. Because I know this craving is just part of my DNA. For whatever reason, that's what I do. I crave children, okay? Especially my grandchildren. So with the insight that that craving is insatiable, I was able to go, all right, so thank you. And what loving action can I do now? That's just completely satisfying. One more example. A lot of seeds were watered this last week or so of fear that an opposition political party was going to take over. And I was noticing real waves of fear, like shortness of breath, heart beating fast. Um, my ideas that were coming and feeding that were danger, chaos, violence. And um, at the end of democracy, you know, real consequential stuff. So I sat with it and I said, am I sure? And then I realized, I, I tell you, I laughed out loud. I have moved to a ruby red state. And every statewide election in South Carolina, was won by the very party that I was afraid of. And the sky hasn't fallen. 
and I, I hope you hear me when I say that there's work to be done. I'm not saying that you know this this state is perfect, but for me, the notion that it was going to be the end of democracy, you know, that I've started to realize that was just way over charged, and that once I realized that. Um, you know, the sky probably wasn't going to fall. That was a idea that I had. I could look afresh at all of the steps I could take right where I stand in order to help to usher in the, the justice and the equality and fairness and compassionate society that I, I hope for. So, you know, really interesting, this, this pattern. Now, I will say that Ty makes a connection with consumption here. And it is very true for me that um, when I'm stuck in an idea, a thought that's causing me to suffer, I suddenly realize, oh, I'm spending a lot of time on the computer doing something really mindless, or I am really not able to let go of the news, or um, I'm trash talking unnecessarily, or like that's ever necessary, or I feel like shopping for something to make me feel better. So there's all of these consumption things, and I found that when I get caught or or inspired to consume something, that that's usually a good clue that I'm suffering about something. And it's like, eh, why am I on Amazon? What's going on with me that I'm on Amazon? And I love this quote that Ty says. He says, just as we might feel worse after eating a whole bag of chips, we feel worse after hours on social media. It's like, yep, yep. So that's, that's a very powerful clue. So this thundering silence, this accessing our store consciousness for real insight about what's going on and letting go of of whatever the thought is because we can uncover a deeper truth um, that is the thing that in my experience helps us to maintain our poise and um, helps maintain um, peacefulness and um, you know this he calls this he, he he also talks about right thinking that there is a place for thinking but it needs to be right thinking and right thinking he says first of all is non-thinking so we now understand that that we don't want to be caught up here we we understand where the true wisdom is um, so we need to stop this non-stop thinking in our heads and that takes time and it takes a spaciousness in order to access the silence to access the heart's wisdom and um, we need to calm down or at least you know begin to to take care of that disruption that disturbance that we feel inside and entrust our store consciousness as we entrust the soil in which we plant a seed he says it's like hands off the wheel thinking mind is like the hand that plants the seed and the store consciousness is the soil that helps it to grow and thrive so thinking mind is what we need in order to cultivate the our practice of mindfulness we need to create a schedule we need to set aside the time in our lives we need to have thinking mind in order to do that and we need to then allow our mindfulness practice to work throughout the day in order to begin to cultivate that that silence and that insight so i will stop there um, thank you very much for letting me share and we'll go ahead now and open the floor for 